So let's, let's start in the second part uh, of the thing, but I'll, 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 I won't do it completely due to lack of time. But um, I'll, I'll, in this part, I'll go a little bit more theoretical. I'll talk about metaheuristics and also about score design. Uh, but I'll start with score design. Now, to make it easy enough to understand, I'll take the n queens example, and I'll show that right now. So the n queens example is, is pretty simple. You have a chessboard. For example, here's a chessboard. You know, eight rows, eight columns, and put eight queens on them and make sure the queens don't attack each other. So, for example, like this, right? So none of these queens can attack each other. So uh, there's nothing, there's no other queen on the same horizontal line, vertical line, diagonal line, or other diagonal line. And um, so it's a pretty simple problem. And um, I'll use this to explain uh, some of these algorithms, but. Um, uh, what you learn on this one, you can actually use on uh, nerve forcing vehicle and so forth. So as you can see there, there are 32 queens, that's how you put 32 queens on board and so forth. I've actually tweaked this to go to 5,000 queens and, and 10,000 queens, but uh, that's kind of fun. Um, okay. So the, the n queens is a uh, simplified problem. Place n queens on an n-sized chessboard, and those queens kind of check it out. So this is a four queens problem. Uh, this is bad, and this is bad because the, these queens can attack each other. This is a good one. There are no hard and soft constraints. There are only hard constraints. Um, yeah, there there are shortcuts that exist, so it's a bad thing to benchmark on. Um, and the score function is way too simple to uh, to, to derive too much from it, but it's, it's a good. I'll, I'll use it anyway. So okay, here you have a bunch of solutions. Uh, none of them is feasible. Uh, in all of the examples, uh, one of the queen, one of the queen pairs can attack each other. You know, two queens can attack each other. Um, so which one is better? Right? Um, that's about score design. Um, this one looks pretty bad because all the queens can attack each other. While this one looks better, at least some of the queens cannot attack each other. Right? So there is, they're not all equally bad. Some is better than others. So we need an objective scoring. And if you're trying to, if you're trying to, um, if you do nurse rostering, and you're in the hospital, and uh, you definitely want something like objective scoring. You want this is the way to do it, and you don't because uh, nurse A will say you have to optimize this, and nurse B will say you will have to optimize this. For example, A will say you have to optimize to make sure that on Saturdays, if people Saturday evening they want to go out, that they can go out. Uh, that's probably the young nurses, and the older nurses might say. Uh, on the Wednesday afternoons, uh, I don't want to have shifts and so forth. So, um, it, it, it depends. It, there, if you go to a company and you ask them what are the objective, what, if, what, what do we want to optimize, they usually say, think they all have the same idea until you actually start writing it down on paper. And then there's a slight, there, there's a difference of opinion. And you need to go through that and you have to figure out which is the best one. And again, this is an iterative process, right? So um, um, we need an a way of objective scoring. We need to be able to write this down. So a better score is a better solution, right? So uh, and the highest score is also a solution. So um, let's start with the. Uh, I'll, I'll, so there are a few techniques you can use to uh, model your score constraints, and uh, I'll explain them. Um, the first one is positive and negative constraints. So, and this is the question, right? So we have three solutions, this is solution A, solution B, and solution C. And our goal is to maximize the number of apples harvested. Let's suppose this is uh, a solution where we where the truck drives across in a certain way across our fields and harvests apples. Um, which of these three solutions would you pick? It's a pretty simple question, this one, right? Uh, anyone? Yeah, indeed, the, uh, the third one. So um, how do we do that? Well, we basically just count the number of apples, right? It's, it's that simple. We say, this is one apple, this is three, and this is five. So five apples is better than, so this is the optimal solution. Okay, different problem. Uh, we, we have a vehicle routing problem, where we're driving trucks across the country, and we need to figure out which is the best solution out of these three solutions. And you can see how much fuel they use. So this one uses three fuel, two fuel, and one fuel. And of course, we want to minimize the fuel usage. Some companies might want to maximize that. We don't think about the environment, Others want, but most of them actually want to minimize that uh, because they think about the environment or because they want to save money or both. 
uh, probably usually the second one is first. Uh, so which is the best one in this case? Uh, yeah, again, this one. So how would we do that? Well, it's a negative constraint. So if we want to minimize stuff, we are going to add negative. We're going to add minus one instead of positive one. Because if we, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a second. But let's just count three fuel ratios is minus three, two minus two, and then one minus one. So why do I? Why don't we just say the planner minimize our score function instead of uh, maximize it? Because you might want to co combine positive constraints with uh, negative constraints. You might have a, a, a tractor, um, um, vehicles might be harvesting apples. So that that's the amount of fuel they use, that's the amount of apples they harvest, right? So then uh, you want to combine these two, and that's why for uh, always, opt always maximize the score, and you basically say, give me a negative of, of the one you want to minimize. So things which are bad get a negative score, things which are good get a positive score. Of course, one apple isn't really worth the same amount as fuel ratios, right? So we need to do something called weighting, score weighting. So uh, here's another example. Uh, it's a few, uh, vehicle routing example. Uh, and we have, uh, uh, this, uh, we have unhappy drivers and fuel ratios. So for example, this, uh, this solution, we use three units of fuel, and we have two unhappy drivers. The drivers are unhappy because they drive to a country they don't want to drive, or because they have to work late night shifts, or uh, or whatever, or they're because they're not at home at, in the evening, which is a typical problem, a vehicle routing problem, that you want your employees to be uh, near their home in the evening. Um, so, um, the thing is, uh, the company decided that one unhappy driver is as bad as two fuel versions. The company decided that. That's the, that's, that's the objective thing. So uh, how do we implement this? Well, uh, wait, wait, which is the best one? Anyone got an idea which is the best solution here? Uh, I'll tell you it's not this one, right? Anyone got an idea which one is the best solution here? It's, just, it's, a, it's a number again. Yeah. Again, it's on the right. It's actually this one. So uh, why is that? Uh, well, this one is clearly better than that one, right? Yeah. That's few versions, right? But, um, these two are probably, uh, this, these are maybe not that obvious, except of course, one fuel usage is worth uh, is equal to, uh, one unhappy driver is, is two fuel usages, so that's three fuel usages here, so that's one is indeed better. So let's just put the numbers in there. We basically do an unhappy driver is minus two, and a fuel usage is minus one, and you count them up uh, per thing. So for example, two times minus two is minus four, minus another one is equal to minus five. Then you can easily say that minus three is, is, is worse than minus two. You can easily find that the solution. That's score rating. This works really well if you can put a price tag on everything. On everything. You just basically, uh, if something in your planning problem in your planning happens, which uh, costs you money, you do minus the amount of money it costs. If it gains you money, you do plus the amount of money you, you, you gain. And you basically tell them, get me as much money as get me as much profit as possible. This, if you take humans into account, this employees and so forth, you basically say, my nurse, the nurse, the fact that she doesn't get her uh, day off request, that we will take that as uh, minus one hundred dollars or something like that. You put a price tag on her unhappiness. This might sound really bad, but from uh, uh, from uh, uh, but it's actually from a mathematical standpoint, it's a really good idea because it's a really fair system. Saying okay. Um, and he, he, and planner will try to optimize this. So the, the thing is that planner will try to make the nurses as happy as possible and still save the company as, as much money as possible. So for example, um, if there are constraints which cost money and which might right? So this is the way of putting a price tag on, on, on everything. Um, even if there is nothing that, that is there in price, you can actually use this to uh, if you have. Uh, competing constraints between departments and so forth. Department A likes this and Department B likes this. That we can actually say, okay, we'll put a price again and, and, and weight them against each other, even though it doesn't really represent money. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's important that you use your right score rate, by the way. Um, so uh, if you use, for example, a double, and uh, you have 0 0.03 for this, uh, so you have here. Vehicle routing, which is three fuel inches for vehicle X and three for vehicle Y. 
and the total for the first one would be 0 0.06 but the second one, if it's a double, you'll actually get a rounding error so it's important that you use, if you, you score type, that you use a correct score uh, thing. so if in Java you write the system not uh, uh, printlm and you try, type 0 0.01 plus 0 0.05 you'll get this number that's because double, doubles basically have rounding errors um, you can try this yourself at home now the thing is uh, you don't want your score to be a double, right? Uh, if, 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 uh, in this case, uh, unless you don't care about the, the rounding error, you want it to be a big decimal, uh, which uh, you know all banks use. So you want, uh, and then if you uh, sum the numbers, you'll actually get the, the correct number, zero point zero six. So the thing is, um, in Planner, this is solved by you can actually choose whether you're, you can define your own scores. So um, yeah, so. And scan, in plan this is solved by if you use a simple double score, then you have a double. If you use a big decimal, you get a big decimal. So you can choose big decimals, you can use big integers, you can use whatever you want. You can define your own scores. Uh, yeah. What sort of impact does this have on performance? Oh yeah, big decimal is worse on performance. You want to use doubles for performance reasons. So it's a, it's a game. Yeah. How much worse? Uh, I have no idea. I haven't actually I haven't actually done use case, use uh, tests. On the difference between the two, uh, but uh, doubles are how the processor works, and and big decimals are, are find some code behind it. Uh, would be an interesting thing, thing to test. We can actually try that. Shouldn't be too hard. Um, yeah. So um, the other technique you have, the third technique you have, is score levels. Now it becomes a little bit more difficult, even though although you've seen this one. This is the one of hard and soft constraints, basically. So we uh, have uh, our vehicle routing problem. We're still using fuel, and we, now we want to make sure they're not overloaded, right? So we're not putting too many items on the truck because if that happens, then the axle breaks, and the truck can't move anymore. And when the axle breaks and the truck can't move anymore, none of the items actually get delivered to the customer. So um, right? So we want to minimize the uh, overloaded truck axles, but we want to uh, do that no matter how much fuel you were using, right? So it's worse than that. so it's infinite worth of uh, fuel usages. So this is basically this is a hard constraint and this is a soft constraint. It's that simple. So which is the best solution in, in this case? Yeah. Um, so this one. Why? It's quite simple. Anything that breaks a hard constraint, just throw it out. So this, these are all broken. Hard, all break hard constraints, and then you just compare these two. That's the one. So, mathematically speaking, or at least mathematically, um, in a little bit of numbers, we basically say uh, I count the number of uh, broken axles, that's minus two, I count the number of uh, uh, fuel usages, minus three, and I first compare this first number, like we did previously. Uh, so, when I compare these two, you can see that the minus two is lower than minus one, so uh, this one is better. And if they are equal, like in these two cases, then I take the one with these three users. It's, it's that simple. So that's how you get to the optimal solution. Okay. Of course, Planner doesn't do this with, 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 with seven solutions. It does this with, with uh, loads and loads of solutions. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip the scope folding part. Now, there are a couple of trees. So one important thing to notice about this is uh, the score levels is that you might actually have more than two score levels. You might have hard, medium, and soft constraints. Your hard constraints might be uh, unit, uh, physical laws of the universe. Uh, the medium constraints might be the laws of the country. Uh, I've seen this before, but I say we can. This is far, far more important than anything else if you don't break the law of the country. And then the third constraint might be that save as much money as you can, right? Or maybe your second, your medium constraints are make the nurses happy and the third one is save the company as much money. Or the other way around, it depends on, on who you're talking to, which again is a need for objective score function. It can, can be interesting conversations. Um, so, uh, in Planner you have the score interface, which is basically just a comparable uh, with an add and, and subtract method. Um, and you can implement this yourself, but why would you if you can just use one of the built-in most of the 99, 90, like I said before, 90% or 95% of the users is a hard and soft constraint one with ints. Uh, but uh, we have this in doubles and big decimals and so forth. There's actually um, uh, one which, so this one is one score level, two score levels, three score levels, right? 
but there's actually uh, one that's called bendable score, which is good, which you can actually configure how many score levels it has. So, for example, two hard constraints levels of and three soft constraints levels and so forth give you a total of five constraints levels. Um, but that's very advanced. You should most most stick with the simple one. Here's a fun one: um, the Pareto optimization scoring. Um, so you want to maximize your apples and oranges, oranges harvest, right? But if you know the English saying, it says you can't compare apples and oranges. I'm, I'm not sure what the French saying is. And this is something like apples Should and pears. Carrots. Cabbages and carrots. Cabbages and uh, carrots. So you, so, so you can't compare them, right? Um, so can you optimize this? So here's a bunch of solutions. Can you actually optimize this? Anybody have, have an idea? Right? So let's take a look. This has it gives me one apple. This gives me one orange. Can we can we tell something about these two? No, we can't compare apples and oranges, right? So, so for for real world, think think that the apples re re represent ecological value and uh, oranges represent money. And you're in a company who actually does care about the environment. Then um, and but they don't. But they say ah, we can't put it in a computer program to figure out. Which is uh, which is more important? The apples, uh, no, the ecological values are the oranges. That's something humans need to decide, not computers. Um, so, right? Okay. So let's continue. Can we say anything about this? Okay. So we have this solution and this solution. Can we say anything about this solution? This solution. Yeah, we can. This one is better. It has two apples. This one has one apple, and we don't have less oranges. So this one is better. Same thing if you compare this one to this one, right? This one has two apples. Uh, we don't lose any apples here, but we have more oranges. Why not? Let's take this one. So, oh, and this one is also better than that one. So these three we can already forget about those, right? And if you continue like that, we actually get to something like this. So these are, they're not equal, but we don't know. But um, the thing is, these are the optimal solutions. So what does that mean? That means that um, only an agent can take this one. Because, uh, here you have more apples and less, uh, and you have, don't have less oranges. So even if you are somebody who cares, uh, even if your company cares a lot about the money and doesn't really care that much about ecological values, why wouldn't it take this one? It's, it's, there's no loss to it, right? The choice is between these, right? And that's for the user to decide. That's for the CEO or the manager or, or whoever to decide. Okay, what what will we actually do? So uh, and these are pretty optimal. So. Planner will help, well, so the idea is that uh, Planner will help you f de delete all of these and actually you can figure out between those two. It's called Pareto optimization. Um, yeah, so just so we have these four score techniques, right? So uh, that, that's the one I've identified so far. Um, and uh, how do we combine them? So we have our, our constraints, you know, uh, fuel cost. Uh, minimize, so we want to minimize it, so negative 200 weight, right? Uh, which we might, we might have several of these constraints with different weights, with a score weighting, right? So we get uh, the fuel cost minus 200, the happy drivers, gives us plus, we want to maximize happy drivers, right? 30, so total of minus 150, uh, 170. Uh, and we can add Pareto on there, most don't use Pareto, Pareto is very, it's pretty exotic, but we can add Pareto on there. And then you have the score levels, right? So, so where you have uh, the, the overloaded axles and the sleep de deprecated drivers. There's a law in the country which says that every driver needs to sleep every so many hours. And you, we, to, and the standard I've used in Planner is to actually uh, separate them by slashes. So this is the hard constraints, soft constraints. Maybe you have softer constraints or, or medium constraints and so forth. Uh, Okay, so that's, a, that's, a, that's the score for one solution. So that's why in the examples you've seen uh, at the bottom, zero hard constraints, uh, minus 130 soft constraints, because it's, it's not just one number, sometimes it's more than one number. For n queens, however, it's just one number. It's very simple, it's a simple int score thing. So we have uh, minus one for every soft constraint. So here we have this broken and this broken, so we get minus two, uh, because these queens can attack each other, and here none of them can attack each other. Um, so, for n we don't really need all those techniques, but at least uh, I've shown you all the techniques, so you can, if you have a problem like this, you can actually use that. Um, so, for n our planning entity is the queen, 
our planning variable is a row uh, and uh, it's finding a row. But uh, other use cases have other things. For example, in cloud balancing, we have a process which is assigned to the computer. For employee processing, the, the shift assignment is assigned to an employee. Of course, the employee has a contract, and the shift assignment has a shift, and the shift has a date, and the shift has a as an early and a time being early or late, and there are some skill requirements and so forth. But I'm just showing you the, the, entity, the entities and the variables. For lectures, for score scheduling, we actually have two variables. You need to put every lecture into a period and a room. So, uh, and uh, for vehicle routing, uh, that's a little bit more complex with the customer and so forth. Uh, that's because um, vehicle routing is, is, uh, is uh, it makes it a little bit harder. But um, the course scheduling is an interesting one because it has two variables and, and that's no problem. But then if you change, so that all works well. So how do we find your best solution? Right? So we have all of these solutions and we have these numbers on there. So we can just say, okay, in this case, in these eight solutions, we'll take this one. So we, we can brute force our way through all the solutions, right? Um, so we need optimization algorithms to find them. And uh, we need the best solution in available time. This is a pretty important thing. We don't need the optimal solution. We need the best solution we can possibly get in the time that is available to us. It's a big, it's a bit di big difference. So let's see brute force. Uh, brute force basically tries every combination. So it puts the uh, queen here, and then it puts uh, it tries the first queen on every row, and then. Uh, and it, it tries the second queen on every row, so these are the other rows. So in the end, the fourth queen, so it puts the third queen on every row. And the, the fourth queen, so you can see, puts it here, puts it here, puts it here, puts it here. So it tries all the two, uh, in this case, it's uh, 265 combinations. It tries all of them. Um, I, I couldn't fit all of them on one slide. And it takes the best one out of there, which is this one, or actually our two, that one. Um, the thing is, how does this thing scale? I've shown you this before, brute force doesn't scale, right? So uh, with, N with queens it's the same thing, it, it, uh, all of a sudden it blows up. Uh, so from eight queens to seconds to minutes to hours to days to hours. And no way you can do something like 5,000 queens with this. Um, so here's a question for you guys. Um, if you have 100 queens, which is not a really big problem, right? It's like, uh, it's like 100 processes assigning, to, assigning them to computers. Um, how many possible uh, combinations do we have? Um, if we do this with brute force, how many solutions would we be looking at? Right, so uh, there's one queen per column. Right, so this queen is, uh, is a, will, will won't move uh, to a different column. It's, it will be only on, will always be the A column. This queen will always be the B column and so forth. We have 100 queens, so we have 100 variables, uh, so 100 queens, right? And we have 100 rows, uh, so we have 100 uh, possible uh, places to put each screen because we are using 100 uh, chessboard of size 100. The number of combinations is it more than the number of units? We have 7 billion units on the planet, more or less. Anybody who, if you believe it's more than the number of units, raise your hand. Yeah, quite a few people think they are. They're right. Is it more than the minimal number of atoms in the observable universe? So think about every breath of air. It's full of atoms, it's billions of billions of atoms of, 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 uh, in that. Think about every grain of salt, anything, uh, any millimeter, uh, uh, cubic meter on the sun, it's full of billions of billions of atoms. If you take a look at all of those atoms that uh, we, can, we know about, uh, that our scientists know about, they said, okay, the total number of them is 10 to the power 80. So that's a one with 80 zeros behind it. That's the number of atoms that we no, that's the, that's the minimum number of atoms that we estimate that there are. There might be more because the universe might be infinite. infinite. But all of them that we can see, uh, they say that's, that's at least 10, one, 10 to the power 8. Are there more combinations than that number? If you think there are, please raise your hand. Yes, indeed. So you paid attention to the beginning. Um, because, uh, yeah, so it's 100 to the power 100. So that's 10 to the power 200. So that's this number, which is for a planning problem a tiny one. It's just a hundred processes. It's just a hundred uh, queens. If you look at twelve hundred processes then, um, and twelve hundred computers, then, then these numbers are a little bit bigger than this, and then they don't fit on this one slide anymore. 
So uh, it's actually the number of uh, values to the power number of variables. So if you have 1200 processes on, on 400 computers, you have 400 to the power 1200. Which is uh, a number which is even bigger than the, the one I've just shown. Humans, we as humans don't, don't see the difference, right? Um, the thing is, that's why brute force doesn't work. Right? That's why brute force doesn't scale. It's this to the power n that which breaks it. And um, so let's just take a look. Presume we can do um, about um, 10 to the power uh, 9 scores per millisecond. Per millisecond, right? That means we can only do 10 to the power 20 scores per year, if you do the math behind it. Actually, it's less than that, but uh, I've rounded it up to up. So, um, and if you then do the math behind this, then for 100 queens, it will only take brute force 10 to the power 180 years. Now, remember Moore's law, right? Moore's law will save us. Moore's law, every 18 months, we get a computer which is twice as fast. So every 18 months, we can, no, let, let's say every 18, every two, three, four years, we can deduct one from this number. And this might work, so in 180 years, we'll be able to do 100 queens. Yeah. Oh, I, I, 180 times five, of course, right? So, um, brute force is, is utterly useless. So there's this thing, okay, we can do smarter ways of doing brute force, right? Right? Backtracking with dumps, first search, and so forth. It's, it's a whole bunch of algorithms behind that. Uh, it's, it's a basic promise behind the, uh, the family of algorithms of constraint programming. In the, so there's three big algorithms called uh, simplex algorithm, uh, constraint programming, and metaheuristics. And the whole premise behind uh, and one of them is, 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 is uh, one of those families include, includes uh, backtracking. Now the thing is, um, if you try it with that, you can actually exclude a lot of sol solutions because here we put one queen, we put a second queen, and that means that we don't have to put any of the other combinations on there anymore because we know this this, this is not worth investigating. Actually, we don't know because but as soon as we investigate further, as soon as we find the complete solution here that has minus one, we can actually eliminate having to search through this one, right? So you can't exclude it immediately because you don't know that there is actually a feasible solution, but you can exclude it as soon as you have a better feasible solution. And you're going to look in a smart way, you're going to figure out uh, where to go. Still, uh, this thing doesn't scale. Uh, I don't have the numbers behind this bit, but it basically uh, it works well. Uh, for uh, th this, is, this one works well for uh, uh, to like n20 or something like that. Brute force works to n10. No way you can do n100, n1000, n5000 or something like this. With this. It doesn't scale. Uh, so exact exact methods don't scale. They branch, uh, explodes uh, exponentially. There's not enough CPU. There's not enough memory. And also backtracking is terrible on memory because it's it, it's. It, it just it eats your memory. It, it actually, it, the memory is a bigger problem than the fact that uh, um, it doesn't scale uh, in CPU uh, in, in time. Okay, so we have these first fits which I've already covered, um, where we just put in one queen and we leave it there. Put in the second queen, we leave it there. Then third, we leave it there, and then we find this solution which might not be optimal and so forth. Right? So I'm just um, oh, running out. Um, so let's take a look. So first fit decreasing is a better way of, of doing that, which I've already explained. So this is basically what I've shown on the cloud balancing problem, but uh, now for n queens where we start with the most difficult queens first. And guess what? The, the ones in the middle are the most, most difficult queens. So we place one of these first, uh, then we try the second one. We can't put it here or here, but we can put it there. And we can it like that, and we actually get a slightly better, uh, still a feasible solution. Um, so again, we use this same thing. We use a construction heuristic to get, for example, this, and then we use a bit heuristic to go for there. Um, no, let's get this. Um, so meta heuristics are based on moving things. So you can move, for example, queen to over there, right? But they have also other types of moves, where, uh, where you, for example, swap the queens. For example, take these two queens and swap the location of, of these two, and. Um, you might think that's the same thing as doing two moves, right? Doing this move and then doing another move. Uh, the thing is that um, if you that 
it, it, it actually helps the algorithm if you do the swap moves because it's, it, it, um, it's more likely to take those moves because it doesn't break any hard constraints uh, uh, in between. Um, um, yeah. it's, a, it's an implementation detail. Now the important thing to understand is the number of moves. I've just said that the number of solutions is huge, right? It's 100 to the power 100 for, for n100, so for n64 it's uh, 64 to the power 64, which is like a 1 with 16 zeros behind it. The number of moves, if you just take a look at the change moves, is actually far less. So in this case it's only 4,000. Which is, it still grows quite big because it's n to the power 2, the number of moves. But it's not n to the power n, the number of, of not like the number of solutions. That's why it's actually very well, well, you can actually take a look at uh, doing all moves. And the thing is, if you do a move, if you do multiple moves, you can actually get to any solution. Um, so it's uh, it's just a matter of finding the right moves and the right combinations. Um, so yeah, um, let's take a look. So hill climbing, uh, I, as I told you, so what hill climbing? I'm going to. Yeah, let's do this anyway. Um, hill climbing tries every every move, right? from the starting location. So it moves one green, not more than one green. And it takes the best one, which is in this case the minus three. And it continues doing that like that. And in this case, it finds the perfect solution. Uh, the, the important thing is it's a search path, not a search tree. So as you can see, all of these, actually they are dead ends, right? It tries to move. If it's not better. If it's not the best one, it doesn't explore it further. Um, so it's a search path, not a search tree. Of course, hill climbing, like I said before, it gets stuck in an in infinite loop. For example, it goes from this solution, it does, a certain, does, it does this move and then it does that move, and then it keeps on doing the same move over and over again. It can get stuck in a local optimal, that's why it's called hill climbing. Um, I had to do, do have to do a little bit of tweaking to make sure that this is correct for this one. So uh, I said it couldn't put the queen here, which is a valid constraint, um, but, it, but it does get stuck. So the tab search one, like I've explained, is the one which actually remembers, okay, I've been there, so let's not do that again. So tab search says, okay, uh, it's the same case for tab search. It says, okay, I'm now moving the, the queen one down, so I'll put this queen, which is the, the B queen, into the tab search. Right? Because I put it in the, in the tab search list, that means that all the moves which move this queen, because I've just moved it, are ignored. So I'm not taking any of these things, uh, any of these moves. So I have to move one of the others, in which case it moves the D queen, and as a result, it gets unstuck and actually goes to the optimal solution. And actually, the next move of this is actually the optimal solution. Uh, so um, double search is very like a human. Yeah? You know, if a human planner does this kind of things, it search, he, he, he you know, he puts the, the queens in there. And if you try this yourself. Uh, what you do is you put the queens in there, and at some point you figure out, okay, uh, this is, there are still queens, all the queens are on the board, but there's still, some of them can still attack each other. So you start moving them around. And uh, you move something, and you figure out, okay, um, this works better, and so you're doing hill climbing. At some point you figure out, oh, wait a second, I've already tried moving these two. So I've done this, let's try something else, right? So double search is very, very much like how a human planner does it. Uh, it's very similar. It just does it far. It just takes a look at far more combinations and just just changes far more than a human does. Uh, uh, but it's pretty much just the same uh, idea. So similar annealing is very different. Uh, uh, don't have enough time to explain this one. But there's a, some math behind it. Uh, um, it's an interesting one. If you want to more, read more about this, take a look at, at the top planner documentation. It explains it, or the Wikipedia and so forth. Uh, it's a very interesting algorithm. And there's a third one called late acceptance, which is very new, which is just the, the paper out of it, of it is actually not out yet. But uh, it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a new algorithm, a, a, form of, a, a variant of simulated meaning. And it's, it's working very well, actually, in my experiments. Um, sometimes it, it, it's the best algorithm. Um, and this one, what it does is it's, yeah, again, 
take a look at the, 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 the uh, manual for more information. Um, I'm running out of time. So before I end, I want to explain one more performance trick. Just one more slide. It's a delta score calculation or the incremental score calculation. So what is so? Um, yeah, it, it's it's a little bit out of context of the other stuff. But um, so I, I said that um, to do incremental score calculation, you can use rules or you can write it in incremental uh, yourself. So just so to explain what actually incremental score calculation is, we have a, 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 a two green chess boards, and I'm doing a move that moves this queen one down, right? So we know that these two queens can attack each other, these two can attack each other, and the others cannot attack each other. Right? If we move it down, we'll see that they, they, these two can no longer attack each other, but uh, so B and A can no longer attack each other, but A and C do can attack each other. So what we know is, uh, when we look at it, so A and B can attack each other, A and C and A and D cannot, B and C uh, can attack each other, and so forth. Now, we are moving A, right? So if we now look at this solution, then we have to figure out, can A still attack B? So we have to check that. No, can no longer attack B. We have to check A and C, and we have to check A and D. Right? The thing is, we don't have to check B uh, and C, B and D and C and D. Right? Because we've already checked that here. Right? So this part hasn't changed. This is, this is dirty. This part hasn't changed. It's the same thing. So um, for four queens, that's a speed up of uh, times two because that's, it only has to check half of the things. For eight queens it's a speed off of times four. For 64 queens it's 32 times faster. And uh, of course if you start scaling out to a thousand queens and beyond. Incremental score calculation can be a very interesting thing to do. So um, that's a good reason to, to go beyond the simple Java approach if you really want speed and better results. So um, just to, to summarize, uh, so OptoPlanner is a planning engine. Um, it's uh, very scalable, and uh, uh, if you have a planning problem, do take a look at it. Uh, are there any uh, questions? Does Roots make the, the same has the same approach as a, a database uh, comparison? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, Roots has uh, there's a stateful working memory in Roots you can use. So you can use Roots in two ways. It's a rule engine, right? Rules. You can use it as a, a stateless way and a stateful way. If you use it in a stateful way and you tell them I'm doing these changes, it will only recalculate the changes on, on, on that. So it will do incremental score calculation basically. That's basically the trick that Planner does because the, the Planner uses rules and, and, and the whole score calculation, if you use rules, is done by rules. Yes? Do you think you can use of that banner to implement a regular expression engine? I'm, I'm, I have no idea if regular expression engine, uh, the problem is NP complete or not. I don't think it is. Uh, it, you, you could use it, but... It's with, with not, but it's pretty... Yeah, it sounds a bit similar, trying to, you know, you have greedy operators and you know, lazy yeah. ones, and you try to find the best match. I would, I would actually would think of using rules there because uh, it's it's very much the, the thing is it's not I don't think it's NP complete uh, the regular expression uh, okay. problem Jules because deal with uh, finding better matches than right? yeah but if I remember rules yeah, no. for example ingredients there's a, there's a different there's a there's a well well written recipe and how go from, I think, from regular expressions, how to parse them, right? So how to parse, not, not parse them, but take the text and, and apply them. Uh, but if you, for example, look at OSGI, uh, OSGI needs to, um, which is a different problem, but fi figuring out which packages to put on which thing. It's actually been proven that for OSGI is NP complete, um, which is uh, one of the reasons that I'm not a big fan of OSGI, because any system that at runtime needs to figure out, needs to solve an NP complete problem just to to start up, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, uh, because, yeah, especially something that that's, that needs to start up that fast and needs to, uh, and also more well, importantly, it probably starts faster than the alternative maybe, which needs to download the internet first. Right? 
Uh, no, wat uh, Aldo OSGI, Aldo OSGI, eigenlijk Aldo OSGI implementers do, they do first fit decreasing, something like that. They have a very fixed first fit decreasing thing. So it, it actually depends on which OSGI implementation you use, which, which OSGI things you use. Um, again, this is only in, uh, however, there's a note, this is only if you use certain uh, uh, things on OSGI. So if you use pretty standard things, then, then, then it's very fixed, so you don't have this problem. It's, 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 uh, there's a, there, there are some things on that, but uh, yeah. For expressions, I don't think it's like, uh, so for example, the traveling salesman problem is empty complete, but finding the fastest road, road between two roads on the road network, like Google Maps does or or any other GPS system, is not MP complete. Um, if you go from uh, Nice to Paris, you won't go through Tokyo or through uh, Russia, and it doesn't really matter how how where where Moscow is and where Saint Petersburg is, because you will start going into the direct. There's, there's a, you can use a search algorithm or the Dexter algorithm. You can easily find your route. Um, but as soon as you ha have multiple points, like you know, planning uh, traveling salesman problem and anything that's based upon that, which is a huge number of problems, and then you have nothing complete problem. So it's for from for, for somebody outside of this stuff, it's pretty hard to see which is the difference. Um, but if it's in any of the examples of planner, it's definitely MP complete. And the whole point of planner is actually trying to bring these kind of stuff, these algorithms, into the hands of normal Java programmers. So to uh, you don't need to implement the algorithms. I've just explained some of them in the end, not all of them. But the, you don't need to know them. You just need to use use planner and, and, and tweak it with with the benchmark toolkit and. and that's, it. That's the, uh, the ID behind it. Make it easier for people to use it. Yeah. In your example, you talk about planning, but uh, I don't know if it's possible to uh, implement it uh, using uh, the plan. For example, for the end point program, we can say that you cannot put uh, a queen on the row of uh, before because it's a uh, one queen per row. And uh, the next queen uh, will be automatically in the next row. So, is there any way to uh, prove? Prune solution saying not even consider move that are going to put uh, data in uh, the prune data set. Um, so you mean it? Uh, uh, do you mean brute force? So no, no, it just uh, you, uh, each time you make a move, and instead of uh, computing directly the cost of the move, uh, not computing the cost of the move and uh, not doing the move in specific position. For example, you know that you don't have to put a queen in a row that is uh, yeah. already occupied by a queen. Yeah, so you can say from um, where you define it, so for if you have a planning variable, like the, like the, the queen, you say, okay, uh, what are number, which rows can I put it on? It's a list of rows. You can actually say, I'm going to change this per entity, so per queen instance, and say, uh, you can only choose from these values. And it will never make a move that will go to any of these values it cannot. So. Uh, you could, so you could do two ways. One way is you can add it as a constraint, but then you're saying that there might be a case where I actually wanted to put it there if, if, if that's just, uh, you know, it's, it might be even a hard constraint. Maybe the, the best solution, the optimal solution out there does break hard constraints. You never know if, if, if there is a physical solution out there or not. Or you might say, I'm going to actually put it inside the model, which is, I think, what, what you're talking about, and you can do this pretty easily, where you say that, for example, this process you can assign it only to those three computers and not to any of the others, right? So you can only you can only generate moves to those three computers. You cannot generate any moves to any of the other processes. Okay, and can you be uh, dynamic? For example, can you say that that process cannot be on the computer on which another process is running? Uh, yeah, but that's a constraint because then yeah, but that's a constraint. Then you can go in the model way. Then you have to go in the constraint way. You have to add a constraint uh, if there's a can this process. Uh, for example, for exam scheduling or course scheduling, I had one of those where uh, if you put, yeah, for exam scheduling, if you put an exam into a room, you can actually put multiple exams in the same room at the same time. But there are some exams are special; they don't allow, they, they don't want to share. And so they, they have a, there's a constraint: if you put this exam in, in, in a certain room at a certain time, you can't put anything else in, in the same room at the same time. So it's, it's the same same problem. So you can say a process if it goes to a computer, no one else can. So you can add these, these constraints as you see fit, and as you talk to your business. Right. Thanks, well, thanks a lot. One more. One more. Okay, quick.
Uh, did you ever apply it, for example, to project management? Uh, there's there are a couple of people who have done this. Um, there's a there's one in Germany um, who who is, in the, uh, who is actually building a suite on top of Top Planner to uh, project scheduling or resource scheduling or something like that. So um, he's building a website uh, or page or two or three, and they're using Top Planner to uh, optimize uh, the resources being assigned to projects and so forth. Um, so yeah. Uh, it, it's not open source, but um, if you want contact details, I can put you in contact there. But if you want to try something yourself, maybe very custom to your business or your or your company, yeah, just use Auto Planner and try it. There's actually a new uh, example coming, which is about project scheduling, and which actually gives you a Gantt chart and tries to minimize the mm -hmm. this is the makes pattern. Uh, it's a new competition out there, so um, um, yeah, uh, another guy from Red Hat are implementing it. He actually wrote most of the example already. And I'm going to prove it a little bit and put it into uh, auto planner. So it's it's coming in a few weeks. It would be nice with a copy paste for that case. And uh, did you try to use uh, auto planner for some for uh, computing strategies for you know the games, not video games, but uh, so. Um, uh, yeah, so there's people on the, on the user mailing list. There were people talking about using it to generate a uh, map for games, which is uh, uh, would be nice maps to play. So um, you know, the mountains need to be next to each other, and but there would, should be room for the sea and so forth. As for actually playing the games, uh, that's more of an adversarial uh, thing. So you can use Planner to optimize uh, the, your choices, but you have see, but you need to. Um, implement the, uh, the adversarial thing in in your uh, score function. So you need to say, this is given this information that I have. Um, uh, what do I want? How do I optimize it? Right to give the choice. Um, if you really want something like more like chess or like um, uh, four in a row or something like that, you need to look into uh, mini max problems. Uh, and but I've not really seen combinations with Opto Planner there yet. Um, there's definitely there was definitely some research there, but um, uh, nothing, no nicely paved path yet. Sure. Um, well, we have to go, anyways. So <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs>